we're about five minutes late getting started here, but we're going to go ahead and kick this off. Uh, word on the street is that uh, something really gnarly happening with traffic on Willow Street. So I'm sure some people will be trickling in, but uh, let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome you all to the third uh, science symposium for the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project. We hold this uh, every couple of years to update the public on, uh, on what we've been doing and, uh, and the research that's associated with our project. Uh, in the past, we've kind of had more of an open invitation to speakers for research that's relevant to the restoration. And uh, we've had a lot of interest for speakers this year, and we apologize for those that we had to, to say no to. Um, when we appreciate those that instead did posters. So please take the time to check out the posters. Um, but the good news associated with that is that the project itself is funding a lot of very directed research to answer very specific restoration questions. So we felt it was our obligation to make sure that the research that we were funding is presented here to the public uh, and, and explained to how it's informing the, uh, the restoration process. So before we get started, just a few logistics. If anyone has a cell phone, I think everyone would appreciate it if we just make sure that's on vibrate. That would be great. Um, a huge thank you to the USGS Menlo Park campus for, for hosting us and for sponsoring us uh, today, giving us their facility. Uh, they're also doing a live webcast. So uh, if everyone could remember, this is we're going to try and stick to our schedule because people may be sitting at their computers at work looking at the schedule, wanting to tune into a specific talk. So we're going to try and keep speakers on track. So moderators and speakers, please keep that in mind. And also, everyone who is speaking and even questions from the audience, we ask that you do use a microphone. Otherwise, uh, the, the, the people watching on the webcast uh, can't hear it. And this will also be archived for future viewing as well if you want to take a look at a, a, uh, a talk a second time. So I'd also like to thank uh, CH2M Hill. They sponsored our refreshments today, so we greatly appreciate that. And um, we have an extended lunch break, and the caterer uh, will be providing some lunches for purchase, and we'll give you the details of that before the lunch break. So we invite you to stick around during lunch, um, you know, mingle with folks, and take a look at the posters there. And um, let's see. So uh, getting right into it, uh, 2010 was a, a great year for the project. I think we all know that the island ponds were breached in 2006. And we've all seen, uh, those of us that have been out there, the great progress that the habitat uh, is making out there and evolving. But there have been several other uh, recent uh, phase one actions that have been completed in 2010. Uh, pond SF2, one of our highly reconfigured ponds to provide uh, very uh, high quality uh, water bird and snowy plover and nesting habitat was completed in September. So we're very proud about that. Uh, there's some new public access features and new trails. We invite everyone to go out there and take a look at it. Pond A8, which is our uh, part of our mercury experiment, a, a, a water control structure to allow damp tides into ponds A5, 7, and 8 has been completed. Uh, we're waiting to open it up on June 1st because we have to wait for fish migration season to end. So that is completed as well. So we're looking forward to opening that, introducing tides back into Pond A8. Pond A6 was breached uh, in December. So this is an additional 330 acres of tidal marsh restoration that occurred right at the confluence of Alviso Slough and Coyote Creek. And we have another 630 acres of tidal wetland restoration at the Eden Landing Complex on the east side of the bay that is under construction. It's a two-year construction cycle for that project. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, dirt moving that needs to occur, and so we anticipate breaching that in, in the fall of 2011. And so there's been a lot of progress on the ground with the restoration. But what's exciting about where we open, and also we opened a, a two and a half, approximately two and a half mile segment of the Bay Trail Spine next to Moffett Field. So public access is a, is a component of our project, and so we're very excited um, to open up that segment of trail. But before I turn this over to our, our lead scientist, um, I just wanted to emphasize what's exciting about why we're here today. And I think we all love to see these levees come down and, and these breaches happen and this new habitat be restored. But it can't happen without good science. And that's why we're here today. Um, other projects, other large-scale restoration projects across the country uh, have talked about adaptive management. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a word that's thrown around quite a bit. And we're actually doing it. We have uh, an extensive science program targeted for specific questions that can inform future phases of restoration. And that's what's exciting about today. All the talks you hear today are either directly related um, 
are, are, are very influential on the future decisions of how this restoration project is going to go. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to the lead scientist on the project, Laura Velofi. Okay, good morning. I'm happy and excited to be here. Hope you are too. <clears throat> so I just wanted to um, go over uh, again for the benefit of everybody the key uncertainties that we're um, dealing with in this first phase. So obviously wildlife use of changing habitats and you'll hear a lot about that in the talks today and in the posters. Just as we do these restorations, either pond or marsh restoration, how is wildlife responding? How are birds responding? Fish, the vegetation. And then an important component is the sediment dynamics. If we, if we don't have sediment coming in to fill these ponds, we won't have a marsh. So that's the, that's the, the um, ground floor for our marsh. And then just uh, habitat evolution in terms of vegetation, how vegetation comes in. Um, we have uh, some concerns with mercury and mercury methylation and bioaccumulation in the marshes, especially with in the upper part of um, some of the watersheds in Elviso uh, is historic mercury mines that have given us some legacy mercury that we're dealing with. We have some water quality issues in the ponds as well with um, low dissolved oxygen events and some algal blooms that we're um, sort of grappling with as well in this first phase. And then we have invasive and nuisance species such as invasive Spartina and California gull that are also impacting some of our resources. Um, and public access is a good thing, but we also need to make sure that it happens in a way that doesn't impact the, the water birds that, um, and the marsh species that we're trying to restore. So we have studies looking at that interaction. There's also a whole infrastructure support component dealing with the uh, levees needed that's part of the shoreline study that we won't get into today in this symposium, but it's, I just wanted you to know that it is ongoing. And then, of course, we have concerns with sea level rise and climate change and how that might impact our plans for restoration. So just to reiterate, um, we're on in this adaptive management um, phase on the, the x-axis on the left is the amount of tide marsh to be restored and then on the y-axis on the bottom is the time frame. We're expecting about a 50-year time frame. The EIR EIS says that there'll be about um, at least 50% acres in ponds, 50% in tidal marsh. And that may go up to 90% tidal marsh, 10% ponds. The exact amount on this trajectory, though, on this uh, staircase to heaven, as it's been called, um, will depend on, on the science that we're doing right here in this first phase and the subsequent phases. Um, this is where we're using, especially this first phase and early phases, the information that we gather, the science that we get, will help inform us for subsequent phases. And so it's critical that um, this, this work is done now early and, and well. Um, I, I do want to, um, let's see, let me, oh. I do want to indicate too that um, part of the story that you'll hear today is that we're restoring these areas um, and quite quickly, vegetation is coming in, fish are coming in and using these restored areas, birds are coming in and use the, using them. SF2, um, which is some ponds right near the Dumbarton Bridge, uh, within three weeks of filling that up with water, birds were using it. We're also seeing, you'll hear from Jim Hobbs later this morning, 30, we've documented 31 different species of fish using the ponds and adjacent waters. Two of those species, longfin, smelt, and anchovy, are of concern regionally, and we're getting them into the ponds that we're restoring. So, um, you know, we are changing the, the ha ecosystem in the South Bay for the better, and it's an exciting time to, to be here. And so thank you for joining us. So with that, and these are all the partners working on our project. Thank you. And our website, South Bay, um, restoration.org and if you're on the webcast you can find the agenda and the abstracts for this talk on our website as well. Okay. So
So with that. Oh, I'm sorry. I need introduction. So I'll introduce um, Dave Schulhammer. He's with the U.S. Geological Survey in Sacramento, the California Water Science Center. And he'll be our moderator for this first session on um, uh, physical processes in the marsh. Okay, thank you, Laura. Um, our uh, first session here is really going to address the uh, physical processes, sedimentation, and um, um, the habitat evolution of the marsh. That's one of the key uncertainties, as Laura said, uh, for the restoration project. And our first speaker will be Greg Schellenbarger from the uh, USGS California Water Science Center, where he's a research hydrologist, and he'll be describing uh, sediment movement underneath the Dumbarton Bridge to and from the project area. Thanks, Dave. Um, as he mentioned, I will be talking about sediment flux in the southern reach of San Francisco Bay and the implications of this for habitat restoration. Um, some quickly, some motivation. Uh, this, this project was in part motivated by the issue of subsidence in South Bay. Um, groundwater overdrafts prior to the 1970s left uh, a lot of the northern San Jose Basin and Alviso area subsided um, from those groundwater overdrafts. And Dave Schulhammer has made some estimates um, in the project area that about 32 million cubic meters of sediment will be needed to fill um, these subsided areas of the ponds. And I don't see a cursor. Oh, there it is. There it is. Okay. Um, so the areas in red in this plot here are uh, areas of these ponds that are subsided below mean tide level. And mean tide level is generally considered an, an, a tidal elevation where salt marsh plants can begin to colonize. Um, however, we don't really uh, have a good handle on the uh, quantity of sediment that's fluxing into or out of South San Francisco Bay. Uh, Bruce Jaffe and some colleagues at USGS uh, have done some work that suggests that the flux is generally to the south in this, in this reach of the bay, um, but that is not well quantified yet. The conventional sediment wisdom in South San Francisco Bay is as follows, where we have winter input, um, input of sediments during the wet season, and these sediments come in from two local tributaries, uh, Guadalupe River and Coyote Creek, and uh, it's generally thought that these tributaries are important. The sediment supply from these tributaries is important on a decadal scale. Sediments could also be coming through the delta from the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers. Um, however, the, the importance of these rivers to the supply in South Bay is unknown. A mineralogy study suggests that um, these rivers do not, so do not provide a lot of sediment to this area. So we get input during the winter and during the summer, um, we have high winds, which lead to wind waves, um, which leads to resuspension of sediments um, because we have extensive mud flats and shallow water areas in South Bay. And it's thought that these winds are helping, the wind waves are helping to redistribute the sediments. Study design is we installed a flux station on the Dumbarton Bridge, collecting data at a 15 minute interval. We have an acoustic Doppler current profiler that's measuring index velocity, stage, and acoustic backscatter. We have two optical turbidity probes, one located about four feet above the bottom, one about 25 feet abo above the bottom, and this is in the main channel under the Dumbarton Bridge. Our bridge-based measurements are calibrated with boat-based discharge and equal discharge increment sediment sampling. I'll discuss this in a minute. Um, we do this periodically and use these uh, values to calibrate our bridge station. We're also gauging sediment input on the two major tri tributaries. This is gauged daily during the winter wet season. And we have an instrument package deployed on a mudflat adjacent to the Dumbarton Bridge um, to help us understand processes driving sediment flux. And this includes a pressure transducer measuring waves and a CTD with a turbidity probe. So our equal discharge uh, increment sediment sampling is as follows. Um, we take a boat mounted uh, current meter and we measure the discharge in our given cross section. We then compute five flow centroids for that discharge in the cross sectional area. And then we take the boat to the middle of each centroid and collect a depth integrated sediment sample. And we do this at all, all different stages of the tide. 
and use this to calibrate our bridge-based uh, turbidity measurements. As I said, the study area is far south San Francisco Bay. The red circle, we have our um, uh, bridge-based flux station on the Dumbarton. The star represents where we have our shallow water package um, to the southwest. The sediment supply is um, gauged on Coyote Creek coming in here. It's gauged back here someplace. And then Guadalupe River, which enters through here. And again, the gauge is um, upstream of the tidal reach. And I'd like to point out that this area of San Francisco is a channel shoal system where we have a narrow, deep channel running down the spine of the bay. And this is bounded on both sides by extensive shallow water and mudflat habitats. So quickly, our calibration, um, calibrating our discharge measurements between the bridge and the boat. Uh, we have a very tight relationship with an R-square above 0.98. Uh, the plot shows our suspended sediment um, calibration with turbidity on the x-axis, suspended sediment on the y. Um, the upper sensor data are shown in blue. The red uh, show the lower sensor data. And both of these have pretty good um, relationships with R-squares above 0.8. So we can use our continuous velocity and continuous stage records to compute a continuous discharge record um, as depicted here with the y-axis being water flux or discharge in cubic meters per second. Um, on this plot, positive is in the ebb tide direction, so to the north. Negative then to, would be into far south bay. And the red dots on this plot represent where we collected our field measurements for calibration purposes. So we can use our continuous, our calibrated continuous turbidity record to compute a continuous suspended sediment concentration record, which is depicted below for um, 2009 and 2010. Uh, the y-axis shows suspended sediment concentration in milligrams per liter. A couple things I'd like to point out in this signal. Um, we have uh, some periodicity in high um, suspended sediment, higher suspended sediment concentrations. Uh, this is related to, um, you see this throughout the record, this is related to the spring deep tidal signal. When you have stronger spring tides, you have higher velocities and greater resuspension of sediments, leading to higher suspended sediment concentrations. Um, in addition, during the winter period, we see lower average concentrations than we see during the windy summer periods. So we do indeed have higher average concentrations during the summer than we do during the winter. The most interesting thing, however, is, is both years we have our highest suspended sediment concentrations occurring in the spring, kind of April-May period. These seem to be um, related to the spring phytoplankton bloom that occurs in far south, or in south San Francisco Bay, but the linkage between the two is not yet understood. So we can use our continuous, jet dis our continuous discharge record and our continuous uh, suspended sediment record to compute a continuous flux record at the Dumbarton Bridge. And I'm displaying this as a cumulative flux uh, for, for water year 2009 right now. Um, the y-axis is the, the, the cumulative sediment flux in million metric tons. This um, gray dotted line represents the zero line. So you can see all of these fluxes are negative for the most part. And negative is, in, again, in the flood tide direction or into far south bay from north of the Dumbarton Bridge. A couple patterns we see that I'd like to point out. During the, during the winter, we do have a reasonably steady flux south um, from north of the bridge. So we do get input in the winter as we expected. However, during the summer, when it was thought that the wind waves were helping to read, the wind waves and tide were helping to redistribute the sediments um, that came in during the winter, we see that um, we have almost zero net flux during uh, most of the summer period, which suggests that if the, uh, the, suspended, the sediments are getting resuspended, the um, distribution is, the redistribution is local and it's not past the Dumbarton Bridge. Um, one of the most interesting features is this dramatic southward flux um, that we see in April. And this coincides to that period of high suspended sediment concentration for 2009. So one year of data, we've got a pretty good handle on, on what we think is going on the field. We decided to collect another year of data. Big mistake. Um, so first of all, just to point out some similarities between these two years, again, in the winter, we do see 
a reasonably steady input, uh, steady flux to the south of, of sediment, uh, as we saw in 2009. And again, the summer period is, is basically zero net flux, as we saw in 2009. However, at the, uh, the onset of the high suspended sediment concentrations uh, for 2010, it was in May, we see flux in the opposite direction. This is flux to the north. And it's a very strong flux. It's about half of the total annual flux goes to the north in about one week's time. Um, we have figured out what's going on. Unfortunately, I don't have the data ready to show you, but I can tell you conceptually what, what, is, um, what is going on in South Bay at this time. For the spring flux during the 2009 water year, um, we have conditions where we have higher salinity up in Central Bay, and I don't quite have the right plot. This is um, up in Central Bay, let's say at Alcatraz. Um, we have higher salinities than we have down in far South Bay where they're lower. This is a standard estuarine condition. It's a positive salinity gradient running through South Bay. This generates um, residual density flows that move to the south. And if this is occurring during the period of high suspended sediment concentration, then it generates a high suspended sediment flux to the south, as we saw in that uh, period in April in 2009. However, in 2010, during this onset of increasing SSC, we had a negative salinity gradient in the bay where salinities at Alcatraz were lower than salinities down in far south bay. This is a, um, an inverse estuarine condition. It generates density flows to the north. If this occurs during the high SSC periods, then it leads to a high net flux to the north. So the take home point from this is that outflow from the delta can affect the direction of sediment flux in far south San Francisco Bay. It's not really a new result, but um, uh, it is a very interesting result to us. So what does this mean in terms of time scale for restoration? Well, our preliminary numbers suggest that the tributaries are providing about 20,000 um, cubic meters of, of sediment to far south bay each year. The flux past Dumbarton um, into South Bay for 2009, it was about 200,000 cubic meters. For 2010, it was only about 80,000 cubic meters because of that strong northward flux over that one week period. So the time, the approximate time it takes to fill the, um, the subsided accommodation space of 32 million cubic meters, um, for the tributaries alone, it would take on the order of about 1,600 years. Um, if it were relying only on the flux past Dumbarton, it would be on the order of 200 years, but I caution you to use that number um, very carefully because we can see that we have a high interannual variability um, in actual flux, and we have no idea, having only collected two years of data, whether this 200,000 is average or high, and the 80,000, is it really low? We don't know. Plus, there are other, uh, many other factors that lead to, um, that factor into deposition and sedimentation other than just flux. So future work, we want to continue looking at physical processes that are affecting the, the sediment flux on the smaller scale. Um, for example, we've got wind and wave data that we want to look at. Um, we really want to study the relationship between the spring bloom and the increased uh, suspended sediment concentration because that's a, it's a fascinating linkage and, and we're not sure about it yet. And we're going to maintain the flux station to, uh, to understand the interannual variability. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Greg. Uh, we'll move on uh, to the next speaker. Uh, there will be a discussion session at the uh, end of these uh, four speakers, so there'll be opportunities to ask questions then if there's no time during these short presentations. Our next speaker is Bruce Jaffe with the uh, USGS Pacific Science Center in Santa Cruz, and he'll be uh, describing uh, mudflat loss in the uh, South San Francisco Bay. Thanks, Dave. And I'd like to acknowledge co-authors Amy Foxgrover and David Finlayson. And for those of you who don't want to wait to the end, the main points that I'm going to be talking about 
are that the restoration at SF2 is already causing change on the mudflats. There's distributary channels at the pond outlet and it's just several months afterwards. And then um, trying to put what Greg talked about in a longer term perspective is that in the past South Bay has been a sediment magnet and I'm going to at the end of the talk do a lot of arm waving about how this can be um, counteracted possibly detrimentally so by the high rates of sea level rise and the uh, required sediment for restoration. And then a message that I'm sure that we've all heard many times is just we really need to know more about this system. We need to monitor it, both develop conceptual models and numerical models and have all that link with the adaptive ma management feed into it. So going to start off talking just about the study area at Dumbarton, move on to the post-restoration changes we've observed, and then talk about what we know about the past and speculate about the future, which is unknown, in particular focusing on sea level rise, and then with the summary and conclusions. So the study area here is out offshore uh, SF2, probably just a few miles from where we are right now. And it's between the Dumbarton Bridge and Hetch Hetchy Aqu Aqueduct. Um, there's a very wide intertidal flat um, on the order of a kilometer on the west shore, uh, a main channel, and then a, a narrower flat on the, on the east shore. Uh, one of the focuses of, has been before the restoration to document what the system is now so that when restoration occurs, which it's already started to, um, that we um, can, de can determine what changes are being caused by restoration. And so one of our tools here is uh, swath bathymetry. This is, a, this is our uh, vessel and some transducers here that, that we use. This boom is lowered down into the water. And the way it works is that it sends out sound and it um, uses uh, the transducers as uh, their offset so that you can use uh, the shift in the arrival times to get bathymetry and it creates this um, pretty amazing map where uh, continuous uh, depth data across the flats and into the channels and the um, for every square meter we've got about 30 uh, depth readings and our reproducibility if you average over that square meter has a standard deviation of about uh, um, on the flats somewhere less than five centimeters and in the channels less than 10 centimeters. So we're able to detect very small changes. Um, the mud flat is in fact flat and uh, the channel here is about 15 meters deep. So talking about the post restoration changes, the, um, this is the, the series of uh, surveys that we've done bef uh, mainly pre-restoration. Restoration happened right here before these last two surveys. And um, you can tell we got better doing it, getting more complete coverage. Um, I'm not going to talk about the seasonal changes. I'm very excited, uh, Greg and uh, Dave and I have talked about comparing the seasonal changes in the mudflats to the s seasonal changes in the flux, and that's something we're going to do. But I, I thought it was important to hear talk about more of the longer term changes and um, talk a bit about sea level rise and give a perspective at least from the, um, the his what's happened in the past and uh, what we know about uh, the system now on, on what some effects might be. So, but getting back to the pre-restoration uh, changes, this is a backscatter image where there's intensity. So, um, the backscatter responds to um, the surface, uh, the hardness of the surface. Uh, you can see that pretty featureless right out here in the uh, the mud flats. There's some interesting things going on in the in the in the channel. It also responds to um, the um, microtopography or topography, where you get a more intense return off of 
uh, slopes facing towards you and, move, and you get shadows and slopes away from you. So you can see here in the, the restoration here is where there's an inlet to SF2 and an outlet to SF2. And so pre-restoration, this is uh, what it, um, actually they, they had already dug these channels you can see in, in September, but we hadn't, this was taken just right after they started opening up, so there wasn't much effect. There was a little bit of effect right in here, but this is what we saw um, a few weeks ago. And you can see that the outlet here um, is feeding, um, is disrupting the, the mud flat. And there's a, a close up of it in creating this pattern of distributed channels. So it's just um, a question I have is whether this disruption is going to be uh, confined to this area or whether it's going to grow. And if it does grow, uh, in what way it will grow and how fast. So these are n this is not a, a um, topographically not, not a large feature. If you do cross sections across the uh, disruption, you're just, these channels here are just on the order of uh, 10 centimeters, so they're, they're real minor at this point. Again, the question is what's going to happen in the future. And then this, uh, this channel that was cut for, for the outlet uh, has been filling in and it's only about a half meter deep now. So moving on to what's, um, what we know from the past and uh, doing some speculation on the future with respect to sea level rise. Uh, the Coastal Conservancy funded a survey in 2005 and we compared it to what we collected in 2010. Uh, these red colors are areas of deposition. This is a difference between the two surveys. So, And the blues are areas of erosion and the darker colors are more than a meter. So in a five, slightly over five year period, there were some significant changes um, pre-restoration. The mud flat itself didn't change a lot, which is expected because if it's um, certainly it wouldn't maintain being an intertidal mud flat if it started growing, um, you know, elevating. And uh, the expectation is for it to um, more or less keep keep up with sea level rise, which over the five-year period was, was wasn't great. But the mud flat, uh, the width did did um, increase as, it, as it, the channel edge of the mudflat migrated out. So the channel narrowed and deepened. So this is a little area here and where we're doing the study Dumbarton. And just to give the overall perspective now, looking in, you know, if you're trying to study what's happening at one location and it's connected to other locations, you really have to know what's going on at the other locations. So. The brown here is mud flats in, in far south bay, south of Dumbarton. And um, you know, it's approximately two thirds of the area or a bit more. So extensive mud flats. Uh, and looking at a longer time scale than the five years, now we're gonna be looking at, at a period where we, um, of about a little bit over 20 years. And interesting patterns, the channels are filling in well, first of all, the first impression is it's very red. So it's that sediment magnet. Uh, there are areas of erosion, the blues in, in the middle of some channels, but some of the channels are filling up and narrowing and pretty dynamic. And the mud flats in general are, are um, filling, but you can see there's, there's some, some areas where there, there's some loss as well. So what I'm going to do now is show in the past what's happened and to show um, and what type of volumes are involved with this and then um, compare that to what we expect in terms of uh, sediment demand for just associated with sea level rise and also throw in with restoration. So with sea level rise, there's different scenarios you can use. Um, right here, these numbers, AR4, this is from the 2007 I IPCC, and this did not include melting of glaciers. And then um, this is uh, Vermeer and Ramsdorf, where there's, uh, it's an empirical, semi-empirical method uh, where it does 
have a relationship to sea level rise and temperature that does account for, for, for melting of glaciers. And you can see it's much higher. And um, recently there's a document, uh, State of California Sea Level Rise Interim Guidance document in 2010, October actually, so just a few months old. And average uh, sea level rises um, over 40 years were um, between 2010 and 2050 were about 36 centimeters. But you can see, and so that, that corresponds to a, a rate of uh, 0.7 centimeters per year. But you can see it's accelerating, and by 2100, the average over that 100 year period is, is um, uh, 1.2 centimeters per year. So, how does this compare to what's been going on in, in the Bay, uh, in the far South Bay? Um, can, we, can the sediment that's coming in historically um, allow the, the Bay to just accrete? Or, or right, the bay floor to rise as sea level rises. So here's the estimates. This is interesting here. It looks like uh, earlier on from the 1850s to 1930s, it was a lower rates. These, these rates are in um, centimeters per year. And so half a centimeter down to almost nothing. But these last three years here, or these last three periods from 1930s on, were, you know, a centimeter and a half to two and a half centimeters. So how does that compare to those rates that I just saw showed you? And these graphics here show the, the, the change maps with the red being deposition. Um, so keeping pace with sea level rise for that uh, first uh, period up to 2050, um, it looks like if we if these uh, um, amounts of net sedimentation in South Bay were to keep up, there's enough sediment to, to have the, the floor of South Bay accrete with the, um, with the sea level rise. Um, and even if you go to that average rate um, over the next 100 years, if it up to 2100, they keep up. I will say that I didn't point out, but it does accelerate. So up in here, you're getting up around two centimeters per year, even a, a bit more. So it's um, if you put a third line on there, it'd be up in here. So it's starting to stress the system. So um, what's the relationship with mud flats and the and this sedimentation rate? It's a pretty strong relationship. When there's a lot of sediment coming in South Bay at Dumbarton, the mud flats widen, and when there is less coming in they narrowed. So there, there's a relationship there. A lot of work still to be done, but there is a relationship. So um, now throwing in the, uh, the restoration to this picture, it's a little difficult to do because we don't know how long it's going to take. Um, I've got a stop sign. So this is my last slide, Dave. Um, so the, this rate is 0.75 million cubic meters per year, and that's that line there. Um, and so, again, showing that it could keep up with sea level rise. That's actually pretty good that I have to go through this quick because it is pretty, pretty soft stuff, pretty arm wavy. Um, but if you start putting in restoration on top of this demand for sea level, to keep with sea level rise, um, you start um, potentially having to have more sediment um, than is in the system. So I, I'm, I'm going to put up some the points, and I, why anyone wants to read those can, but I, I had a thought when I was preparing this that we're talking about taking this slow and steady, but uh, there could be an argument to do it fast and furious, and the argument being that as sea level uh, rise accelerates, there's going to be more demand from that to keep up just with sea level rise, and we have excess sediment now, so it's, I'll just... Um, put that thought out there. And a, a counter thought, though, is that all this is very simplistic modeling, you know, conceptual, not even modeling, conceptual ideas. And there could be a lot of things about the system we don't know, redistribution, et cetera, that um, make these simple assumptions really invalid. So quite a bit more work needs to be done. Thanks.
Thank you, Bruce. Our uh, next speaker will be uh, Brian uh, Fulfrock from Design, Community, and Environment. And he'll be describing some remote sensing work looking at the evolution of marsh vegetation. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, using remote sensing to track the marsh vegetation in the South Bay. Hopefully I can get this to work. Uh, the project is a team of, of a group. Uh, key among that is myself and uh, David Thompson, our lead biologist and GIS analyst who um, help work on the project. This is a picture of a chubby me and a thinner David out in the field. Uh, what are the goals of the project? I think um, they're in conjunction with the sediment studies is to track the changes to marsh vegetation that are occurring during the restoration process. Um, and the idea was to build a semi-automated model using satellite imagery to track the vegetation. Um, it's a pretty daunting project because we're mapping about 30,000 acres, which is twice the size of the restoration area. Um, and we're shooting for about 80% accuracy throughout that entire area area. The project is a three-year pilot project. Uh, we started in 09 and we're moving into year three and it was designed to be uh, timed with the breaches. Where are we right now? We're completing our year one and year two classifications. We're, we're about 90 percent complete on those and we're currently fine-tuning the model. We've already achieved 80 percent and we're trying to do a little better. So um, what are our methods? I'm going to go through these quickly. We set up a series of mo mapping protocols or procedures before we start, which have to do with minimum mapping unit, which is what MMU stands for and what scale of analysis we're working at. Um, the MMU, the working MMU is a quarter hectare, which is kind of actually pretty large for the area. And in reality, we're mapping at a smaller scale. Um, what really impacts that is the size and shape of the marshes, which there's some examples of these pictures from Bing maps here of, of low, mid, and high marsh, and they really vary. So the actual scale of mapping changes according to the type of marsh. Uh, we're using Iconos one meter multispectral imagery, <coughs> and we're timing this once a year around June or July, hopefully at mean low or low water. Um, which has been quite a challenge, and I'll talk a, a little about that. And, and the other, for, to do a time series analysis, we're normalizing the imageries over time, and we're, right now we're using a, a very simple relative correction called histogram matching, although I hope to do um, uh, absolute corrections using uh, atmospheric corrections, but that those didn't work out as well as I, as I had hoped. So, the, the project is really four steps. It starts with um, developing a series of habitat classifications, which are based on the Manual of California Vegetation and a uh, field survey method based on the California Native Plant Society's rapid assessment method. Once we sort of get an idea of what, of what vegetation alliances or associations we're mapping, we take that back in the lab and we build training sites um, for each habitat class. And there's pick little examples of that here. Um, so this is some um, uh, wonderful lepidium. Uh, we go out in the field, we, we verify that it's there, we draw a training site and we use that to run, run a model in, um, in AirDAS Imagine. We're using supervised classification and maximum likelihood is the algorithm that we use once we get those training sites. <clears throat> once we run the model, we review it extensively both in the lab and in the field. We do a systematic review of the entire study area based on a grid. The grid cells are about a quarter uh, square kilometers. And then we send David back out in the field uh, to, to help calibrate some of what we're seeing. We update the model and rerun them. Um, once we are happy with where we think the model is, and this is a big chunk of the project, we go out and we validate that model by sending uh, David out in the field to do a stratified random sample. So I'm going to go through this quickly so I can show you some pretty pictures of, of the results. But 
The first step is um, this rapid assessment method. We're using a, a submeter Trimble GPS and TerraSync, which is a software that we use on the Trimble to, to, for the digital surveys. And, and the idea here is to characterize the spatial and, and variability of rare and common plant associations throughout the area. <clears throat> the method is really uh, one that's based on dom rules of dominance. So it's really based on percent cover dominance and those relative associations that we find out in the field. Um, I talk very abstractly, but we're talking about, you know, these different kinds of marsh habitats that are well known in the bay, uh, perennial pickleweed, annual pickleweed, uh, high marsh species like gum plant and alkali heath, and, and the dreaded pepperweed, which we see everywhere. Uh, what, what are some of those uh, types of information we gather? Some of the key things I think are common in uh, plant vegetation mapping, our percent cover, phenology, the pattern and shape of the particular patch, the height class. Um, we mark adjacent habitats because when we bring this out in the field, it's really important to see, uh, to, to relate what we're seeing out in the field to uh, what we're seeing on the satellite image. We also take quite a bit of photos. We've acquired thousands of photos over the year and a half. Um, none of them are nearly as pretty as Chris Benton's photos, although there are some that are quite nice, and I'll show you some of those too. So this is uh, just a simple map that shows the distribution of our field sampling. We've done quite a bit. We've done quite a bit more than I think a lot of remote sensing projects might, because I think there's <coughs> the, the salt ponds and the baylands are uh, probably one of the a big challenge in remote sensing because of the spectral variability that's both within the ponds, on the marshes, and in the water. So we've, we've covered quite a bit of the area, and this is for both years. We have about 775 uh, field sampling points with, uh, with us and our partners. And so this is just a quick uh, graph of, of how those break down into different as plant associations of dominance. And on the left is uh, an example of uh, vegetation that we've observed not on levees and not in uplands, but in marshes themselves and the, and the dominant alliances. And not surprisingly, pickleweed and pickleweed associations take up quite a bit of it. And on the, the graph here is a breakdown of the actual associations that we see between year, and one's, year one and year two out in the field with pickleweed. And that helps sort of drive our, our training. Uh, and then we come out with sort of a final set of vegetation that we're going to map. And we do that, we're really focusing on uh, the freshwater brackish and salt marsh uh, systems. And, we, and, and, you know, I started with very lofty goals and we come down to a more refined set where the actual variability spectrally between these veg vegetation groups is something that we can actually map. <clears throat> we're also mapping non-vegetative features like mud flats. One of the big things was we're sort of mapping mudflats with biofilm. It's something that we introduced into the model that actually helped significantly distinguish uh, mudflats from vegetation. So then we take that information out from, from, um, from the field and we come back in the lab and we digitize these training sites to help run the model. We convert these training sites to spectral signatures. We run a habitat classification based on that and we get a result. And this is the result for year one. Um, so you're seeing the restoration areas in red. So we're actually mapping quite a bit of marshes that are right outside of the restoration area, including the Dumbarton Shoals and Flats. So we've run the model for year one and year two. <coughs> once, once we have that model done, we impose this grid on top of the model and we look at each cell or, or a sampling of each cells. This is a zooming in of outer bear um, with the three cells highlighted. And we look at the results of the model. In this case, we use as garish colors as we can to be able to distinguish between the vegetation types. Um, so I, I read these colors. They make a lot of sense to me because we've been looking at them so long. And we use orange for pickleweed and pink for gum plant. And when we ran this model, there was obvious problems with it because this middle part of outer bear is, has no or very little gum plant in it. So we run our review 
and we calibrate that with a whole range of data sets, including the LIDAR collected by USGS, work done by Invasive Spartina Project, the City of San Jose's Mars studies. We, we combine that review in the lab, our calibration in the field, and these other data sets. So we go out in the field, we, run, we put the model on our, uh, our field computer to help sample what's actually going on and improve the model. So in this, in this case, this is an earlier version of the model in A21, and it's telling us there's tons of, of gum plant. In the middle, we have a near-infrared image from 2009, and then courtesy of Chris Benton, his kite photos, which are far prettier than any of the satellite images, um, and, and really show what's going on with this pickleweed. So we run this review, and we create an improved model. So here we have, um, in 2009 on the left, the, the pickleweed um, and in, in the middle of 2010 image and then the, the models for each of those years. And in this case, purple is biofilm or mud with biofilm on it. The green is algae and orange is pickleweed. And we're really picking up on the growth of, of pickleweed as it's forming around the channels in A21. So you can see here on the, the right, I think I've lost the mouse, you see this this orange here is representing the pickleweed that we're seeing growing around the channels in A21. Now I'm going to show uh, another example in A21 of that same kind of growth that we're picking up on. We have this 2009 to 2010 images on the left, and here you're seeing uh, a little pickleweed around the, forming around the uh, channels in, in 2009, and it's really its growth in 2010. And, and possible uh, input of sediment too. We're seeing a lot of mud in the 2010 image um, as well as the growth of pickleweed. So um, this is one of the prettier slides and on top again these are Chris Benton's photos of a small channel in the north of A21 and um, it actually took quite a bit of time for us to find this because you know this is about 120 feet and 120 feet is a relatively small area on a 30,000 acre uh, study area, but we found the location in the 2009 image. And here you're seeing the September 2009 is the closest to our June 2009 Iconos image. And you're seeing the pickleweed here, both annual pickleweed in sort of this mottled gray and uh, perennial pickleweed in orange starting to form around that channel. In 2010, this sort of reddish color in uh, near infrared shows a potential growth of that vegetation and we're picking up on that in the 2010 image and it, you see a combination here in Chris's photo of, of both annual and perennial pickleweed and we're also picking up, up on that in the model. Um, so uh, we've seen a lot of uh, good continuity where there's some growth but not necessarily a lot. This is what I think is, we call mud island. Um, I don't know, I'm not sure if it actually has a name, but this, t this here, this yellow is Spartina. Um, the, the gray, again, is annual pickleweed, and the orange is perennial. And we're seeing a very similar distribution in 2010, and the, this sort of tail here on the left, which is a potential growth of Spartina, we're picking up on very clearly. Again, this is the southwest corner of A6, the duck's head. Um, and this is just a, a good example of we're seeing quite a bit of consistency in the low marsh. The yellow is the Spartina, um, both in 2009 and 2010, um, and, and with not much change, although a little change here in A6. Um, we can also pick up on the changes, potential changes in high marsh that might be related to phenological change. Um, in this case, the pink is gum plant. I, I chose pink because I thought of gum for Grindelia. Um, when you're doing these things, it's very helpful to have simple clues like that in reviewing the model. And, and so here we're just seeing that the Grindelia along the channels at the mouth of Mary Slough is certainly apparent in 2009, and, and there's a potential growth of those here, including other high marsh plants like Jaumea. Um, and this, another example of plant phenology, here we use red to represent rack or dead woody debris, and, and potentially in 2009, uh, there was more of that when we took the image than in 010, um, and they were both taken in June or July, but we can't control for th those fine differences. Here's a real uh, stark example of that. <laughs> I 
and I think I've already gone over here. So um, I'm going to quickly go to the, uh, my couple of final slides. And so these are more examples of where the model is running well. Chris Benton's photos of high marsh and mid marsh were picking up on all that. Again, the growth of that mid marsh with Grindelia and Jaumea, the growth of Lepidium. Um, we're already collected our validation and we're running uh, our validation on our final habitat classification. And we have some issues, and I think key among them are phenological. Um, we had some problems tracking sediment because of the timing of the image, um, and let alone the timing of the image with tides, but getting cloud cover. But luckily, we got two years with, good, with almost no cloud cover. Where are we right now? We actually are taking some nice pictures. This is a pan that David took uh, out in Bear. Uh, we're fine-tuning our training sites for, for the final habitat class. We're running our validation, and we're preparing for year three to do some final improvements. Sorry to run over. Thanks. Um, our uh, next speaker will be uh, Ron Duke, who's president of H.T. Harvey and Associates, and he'll be describing uh, restoration after 10 years at Cooley Landing. Ron? Thank you. I'm going to talk, talk today about uh, uh, marsh restoration we did at Cooley Landing. Uh, and it's been 10 years. Uh, Michelle Orr is a co-presenter here, but a lot of other people contributed, as you see here, both from Harvey and Associates and ESEPWA, and especially uh, Papadopoulos, Mike Rafferty, and Kin Kinsley Bernard. So this is a joint work that we've been designed. We designed the restoration and implemented it. Um, and of course, uh, Midpen, it's their property, so um, thanks to them as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, as we go through, as I go through the discussion, you'll, we're going to cover a number of the topics that, that are germane. Uh, how, how does marsh get restored? How does, sed as sediment accumulates, where does the vegetation come in and how? But most importantly, um, we're doing a lot of tidal restoration in this project, and we want to know how to best do it. Um, so this, is the, this site is the first one around the bay where we combined several different uh, restoration techniques. First of all, we breached at historic channel ro locations. We put in ditch blocks to try to uh, recapture the, t the tidal prism uh, in, in the main channels. We um, lowered the outside levee to get sheet flow across the entire front of the levee. And you'll see some of the results for that um, as, as we move through. So why, why, why think about these things? Well, part of what we were trying to do is restore complex tidal, the, the, the very fine tidal systems that are in historic marshes. Um, that's an area where clapper rails forage. It's an area where Alameda, Alameda song sparrows forage down in the small tidal channels. And if we look at historic restoration, where ditch blocks were not used, um, we, get, we get a different system here. This is Faber Tract, which is, was restored in the early 70s by my dear f friend Tom Harvey. Uh, not he didn't restore it, but he helped design it. And many others here who are part of the South Bay Salt Pond Project. Um, it's a wonderful marsh, but as you can see, this is the historic bow ditch, and it has captured a, a, a majority of the ti or a lot, a lot of the tidal prism, and it's there 40 years later. I want to just show a few other res restoration sites. Uh, this is, of course, Bear Island. Bear Island we bre breached um, on its own. And you, you can see it, it has its wonderful habitat. It has plenty of tidal, it has tidal channels throughout. But these historic borrow ditches are still there and, and will be. Um, this, this section of Bear, we used ditch blocks to try to make sure that this major tidal channel system um, was restored. 
And again, these are the island ponds where borrow ditches were not blocked, breaches were made, and um, at this point, the borrow ditches are still c carrying a lot of the, a lot of the uh, tidal prism, but they're silting in in the back. So this gets us to A6. So we've gotten, we've gone, A6 is an experiment where we're going to be doing, um, a, where, it, where we, we used, there's an experiment to see the effect of ditch blocks. So these, these, ditch, these ditch blocks were put in. These breaches were made without ditch blocks. And we're watching the, the habitat over time to see what the difference is and what difference in quality what difference in quality of the marsh there is. So now I want to go to, this is Cooley Landing. Cooley Landing, um, this is the site. Favorite tract is here. This is Laumeister and Cooley. And just one last point with respect to uh, bar ditches. Uh, bar ditches, um, of course, I've worked a lot with salt marsh harvest mice. And this is, this is some work we did oh, 20 years ago, now 10 years, um, where we captured so har harvest mice out on a marsh plain at Calaveras Point and watched them move around. This was one week of trapping out on the marsh plain. This was in a low tide cycle. On the next high tide cycle, a week later, we, tr oops, we trapped just on the levee adjoining it. These are marked individuals that moved uh, with next, in the next week up onto the levee to, to avoid the high tide. So um, part of the restoration design at Cooley was to make sure that, that, mar that mice on the, on the uh, marsh plain could, would, could move to, a higher, to higher ground and not have to cross a ditch. So this, uh, actually, these, these sites, Cooley Landing, um, Laumeister, and Faber, uh, are a, good um, a pretty good test example of what, we've, what we're trying to do in, in A6. Faber tract, of course, was restored in the 70s. But here in, here in 48, this is what Cooley Landing looked like with its historic channels. Laumeister was never diked. And as you can see in this photo, it has a nice channel system with grindelia. It's loaded with clapperill and harvest mice. Of course, favorite tract is two. But uh, so we were looking at the system. How could we take what was done at Faber and do it a little better to try to cre recreate the channel system? So here was the design, what we did. Um, first of all, we put in what were called training levees or berms across the locations of the historic channel, or to, to parallel historic channels. We put in additional ditch blocks in these locations, and then we breached first in two locations, and then um, in 2005, a third breach was created. This outboard levee was lowered all, all the way along. And you can see here, it was a good candidate. You can see the historic channels were well developed. And then we've done 10 years of monitoring after that. And this is a, a slide from, uh, from ESA PWA, but it's, uh, shows the transects that were done. So there, there was a transect established along the uh, boardwalk, a pg and &E boardwalk, and in each of the tidal channels that were created, and in a number of locations throughout the marsh on small tidal channels. We did, um, there were sediment pins put in, there were, um, there's tidal, tidal gauges put in, so it's, it's a, it's a very extensive monitoring program and some photo points uh, here and here, which you'll, I'll come back to. And I'm going to present just a little bit of the results, um, especially that are they're interesting. If you see this, uh, if you see this uh, transect, it crosses 
all three of the major, well, these two major tidal, tidal systems and a number of uh, smaller systems as well. So what are, what are the results? This is a current um, 2010 color infrared photo. You can see pretty clearly these channel systems coming in, being restored. You can also see scour out on the, out on the uh, out adjoining mud flats. So we went in and uh, mapped the, the, the tidal systems as they occur right now, and this is what we come up with. So these, this is what um, the system looks like now. And all of these lighter blue areas are historic channels that were uh, recaptured. It's about eight acres. Um, we did have one situation out in this location where the uh, bow ditch in here was essentially recaptured as this scoured out. And so we do have a, uh, this part of the bow ditch didn't, um, it's, it's starting to fill in again, it, but if you look at this outboard side, that entire bow ditch filled. And in fact, it filled within about uh, three years. We also, so if you remember the, um, this cross section, uh, this is what we see. So the black here is the original marsh elevation and the blue is the 2010 uh, cross section. So you can see we get, there was about 1.4 feet of sedimentation across the marsh plain, which you can see here. But you also see that these historic channels were recaptured and deepened so you've got a very nice system um, functioning just like we hoped it would. <laughs> and the gray ones are in between marks um, over the years. And again, uh, this is the central breach, the longitudinal cross-section. Um, had the original ground surface elevation. And you can see the scour. This is the channel within the site. Um, it actually, and this is the bay side here, beginning years it actually uh, there was a little scour pool created but after 10 years this channel is, is relatively um, gradually sloping out to, to out to the bay and actually over time the shell is uh, right at the beginning you could actually see a, essentially a nick point in the channel and it as it might over the years it migrated back into the site um, so what have we got now we mapped this mapped um, vegetation in, in 2010. And right now, about 60% of the site is vegetated with uh, salt marsh species. The dark green is pickleweed. The lighter green is uh, annual pickleweed, the greenish yellow. There is cordgrass, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. And now I've just got a little bit of show and tell. This is one of the photo, shots, photo sites between 2006 and 2010. This is actually the channel that recaptured the bow ditch. Here is the um, boardwalk. And the boardwalk in 2000, uh, unvegetated, and look at it now. You can also see this is one of the remnant channels that we tried to recapture, and you can see quite clearly how it, how it did. Another site, um, vegetation coming in. And then these are the things that I was particu I'm particularly impressed with. This is the outboard levee, before and after. Um, no bar ditch here. And this is even a, a shot that shows it a little more clearly. We have an outboard marsh, pickleweed marsh. This is with the former levee. And then falling off into what used to be the bar ditch. So we have just a very gentle uh, pickleweed continuum across what used to be a levee. And this is the final slide. Um, uh, we have, over the course of these 10 years, uh, battled invasive cord grass. Um, this, this year's treatment was of about eight acres. You'll see treatment, the, the kind of greenish areas are where the invasive Spartina program has been working hard to uh, keep, keep, out, keep it out. But in the end, as you saw earlier, um, 
there's, this year we mapped about three acres of pickleweed after treatment, so, I mean, of uh, cord grass. So it's, we've been able to restore the site, get it, get it moving towards a high marsh vegetation, and keep battling back the, pickle, the uh, cord grass. And it's done a good job. So overall, uh, we, I think we, the site is moving nicely and providing the things that we hoped that it would. Thank you. Okay, if our four speakers could please come up to the front here, we can have a, about a 20 minute discussion section. Uh, their talks were all very interesting and they had a lot of content, so they weren't really able to um, answer any questions from the audience. So I thought at first we would see if there's any uh, questions out in the audience, perhaps some general questions on uh, physical processes, sedimentation, marsh evolution, that uh, our four experts could answer. So. We have a couple microphones to run. Please speak into the microphone because this is being webcast and we have our first question. Yeah, hi, my, uh, my question is about dams and uh, wetland survival. And um, it's clear from a lot of studies that you guys have done and other reports that um, suspended sediment is really key to wetland survival and restoration success. Um, a 2010 USGS study found that dams were one of the most limiting factors preventing sediment from reaching coastal wetlands. And it's one of the few things that we have uh, control over. So I'm wondering, um, well, in this watershed here in San Francisco Creek, we've got Searsville Dam, which is an antiquated dam that's blocked over a million and a half cubic yards of sediment from reaching the bay. How best do we assess these dams that have, are basically on every South Bay watershed and the potential to remove some of the obsolete dams and restore sediment transport. Anybody want to answer that one? Yes. <laughs> Bruce, do you have it? Bruce, would you? Uh, is this working? Yep. Yeah. Well, obviously, if you remove the dam, there will be more sediment. Um, and, of course, you have to consider the size of the sediment, too. So it might not be quite the windfall if it's coarser sediment, because it's the fines that are getting into the wetlands. But um, it's not easy. You know, it's expensive to remove dams, and maybe a although it would help, maybe another way to look at this would be to look and see what's within the bay, how connected the bay is, how important are, are those local sources, both would they be if the dams were removed, and, and you know, do the best you can to convince yourself that it, it's worth the cost of remo removing the dams before you do that. But I don't think anyone can argue that if you remove the dams that they're there won't be more sediment. There will be. All right. um, Jim Eichner. This Jim Eichner. This one's for Greg. Uh, I noticed on your calibration of uh, turbidity to suspended sediment concentrations at Dunbarton, your uh, calibration data only extended up to about 20 percent of the maximum observed turbidities and that those really high turbidities were at the critical times in the spring flow. Uh, what uncertainties does that introduce and what are you planning to do about that? Well, um, I, I only showed some of the calibration data, so what I was showing you was the calibration for the EDI to uh, the optical turbidity probes uh, calibrated to the EDI samples. We also have grab samples um, um, associated with each turbidity sensor, uh, and those do cover a higher range. And as well, the calibration data I showed today was only for 2009. I did not include the 2010 data on that. It did not substantially change the, the uh, calibration. Um, so uh, I think the short answer is we are capturing higher concentrations than what I showed you today. Um, and then to deal with the uncertainty, we just put uh, 
you know, when we're, when we're going to publish this, we are putting error bars on, on everything we can, so. There's a question back there. Hi, Arthur Feinstein with uh, Citizens Committee Complete the Refuge and also uh, the uh, San Francisco Bay Joint Venture. Um, between the two first speakers, we got sort of a confusing picture of what's happening with mud. We're hearing that we're getting mud coming in, but it could take, I think you said, up to a thousand years to um, provide the 32 million cubic yard, um, cubic meters that we may need, hundreds of years anyway. And then from uh, you, Bruce, you said that um, looking at climate change, we may keep steady now, not taking into account those 32 uh, million cubic meters of sediment needed for the ponds themselves. And so it sounds like putting that together, we're looking at a depletion of mudflats. Uh, that's the impression I get. And then you were talking about, well, we need to study it more, but we also have to start thinking about adaptive management. And I'm wondering what possible tools do we have under adaptive management to address that issue so we don't lose all those mud flats? Yeah, I've got a, a brief comment on that. Um, one of the things that the, uh, the restoration project is designed to do is to phase in um, additional opening of pond areas slowly uh, and, and the, one of the rationales behind that is um, to not create a giant sediment sink all at once. Uh, create a slow sediment sink um, and allow the natural sedimentation processes to fill that in. Um, do you have something to add to that? Yeah. Well, Greg and I have talked about the fact that his numbers and my numbers are different uh, and we're probably both wrong. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we're both wrong. Um, Greg's numbers are just very short term so uh, the reason his may not be a good predictor of the future is because he had, there's variability that he's already seen in two, two years of data and he, there, you know, there could be big events, small events, he's not sure whether the two years is representative and the reason my data is wrong is because it's the past and things have changed since the past and there's no, it likely will, it, it's going to be different but we don't know how different it is. Um, what, one question that that I have about the system is just how connected it is, um, both between the different parts of it, the channels and the mud flats. We know there's connections. Um, uh, so, for instance, if there was uh, a very strong connection, it, one, one possible outcome, if you don't have enough sediment, is that in terms of the mud flats, it finds its sediment from the channels. The channels themselves will deepen. And so it might not be all doom and gloom. Um, but I, I think the, the real big question I have is not just within the system, but um, outside the system. You know, Dave and Greg are seeing, certainly the, the, the hydrodynamics are connected when you have big flows coming down from, from the uh, San Joaquin, <laughs> Sacramento that it creates a, a fresh area that then drives a the flow out of South Bay. But there could also be connections in sediment and I just don't think we know yet how connected it is and it, uh, I, I guess I'm optimistic that if there's a strong connection, there's a lot of sediment in the bay, there's a lot of sediment going out the Golden Gate. There could, the, it, the, the restoration could be successful even if uh, the back of the envelope comparisons um, aren't favorable. But I think we, we need to do that work to, to really um, either prove that I'm too optimistic or uh, that, that, that that is in fact the case. And one of the other things that we talked about all through the, um, the project in terms of adaptive management is that there are areas in the bay that where there is high possibility of, of resuspension of sediments. Um, areas like on the East Bay shoreline where um, you, know, it, you, you can create areas that will be turbid and, um, and not basically not create um, vegetated habitat. So you can, we can change the way we do the tidal restoration 
to, uh, it, to make it into some of those areas that may be longer term mudflats than others. Um, this question's probably most for Greg and, and Bruce, but anybody. Um, Laura Velopi in the beginning talked a little bit about uh, one of the issues is mercury in the South Bay, and it's an area that my group studies. I'll be talking about it a little bit later. One of the key components of that is uh, to the extent to which Alviso Slough will um, move sediment as we start opening the ponds along Alviso Slough. We just opened A6. A8 is about to open um, in the spring, and that has a lot of implications for the uh, what we've estimated recently is 1,600 kilograms of mercury that's in Alviso Slough and where it's going to go. So my question is, and I was surprised not to see anything on it, um, is there a concerted effort? I'll back up and say one other thing. The estimates we have of how much is there. We, we worked a little bit with PWA, Philip Williams and Associates, who had a model in the early days of the restoration project that, could, that estimated how Alviso Slough might deepen and widen as, as we opened up the notch in A8 explicitly. Uh, that was just a modeling exercise. Now we're about to do it. Who and to what extent is, is the changes in the sediment in Alviso Slough uh, who's monitoring that and how, where do we stand with that? Thank you. Uh, I'll start. Um, we were concerned about that as well, Mark, and so, um, and so is Steve Schwartzbach, and he, he, he funded us to do a, a pre-restoration thorough survey of Alviso Slough. So we've got really good pre-restoration data, and um, you, everyone knows what the the funding climate is with, with the federal government right now. We're, we're scrambling to get money to, to, to do the post-restoration um, survey. So we're set up to do that, but we're, we're not going to be able to do it as it is now. So, but I, I think it's important. Uh, what, what we've established um, down in that area is we have a, uh, a, a, a basically an erosion station established at the uh, Alviso Power Towers right at the mouth of Alviso um, in at Coyote, Coyote Creek. We also have a sediment flux station currently installed um, just downstream of where A8 will open up. Um, however, the funding for those stations is on the block right now and it's likely that we'll have to pull that flux station this summer. Um, shortly after the pond is open. Uh, there's just no money to support it right now. And I, I believe there is also some monitoring going on um, by, uh, um, is it Josh Ackerman, I believe, is doing some monitoring in Alviso Slough as well. Um, Hi, Laura Velopi. This is this questions, um, I guess, uh, more geared toward Bruce and um, Greg. So, uh, Greg, in your talk, you talked about this um, salinity gradient being connected with the flux of the sediment northward out out of South Bay. Um, w I didn't quite catch the cause of that, or what the is it related to? Um, La Nina, El Nino, or or was it other? No, it's it's much simpler than that. It's just high, uh, relatively high delta outflows. Um, if the the delta outflow, the fresh water coming in from the Sacramento San Joaquin, is enough to freshen Central Bay relative to far South Bay, it'll create that condition where that salinity, the inverse salinity gradient, the negative salinity gradient, will occur. So this happens typically. Um, for, for relatively short periods of time when it happens, um, but it can produce very dramatic effects in those short periods of time. Um, but it's, it's just a very natural phenomenon um, uh, related to delta outflow. But, but that is kind of counter to what Bruce was saying, and I, mean, I guess you acknowledge that, that you know, we do have a lot of mud flats in South Bay, and so if this is a predominant mechanism or process, uh, you know, it, it's it's counterintuitive that we that we wouldn't be seeing mudflats in 
well, and, and uh, the sediment, sedimentation that we do in the South Bay. Well, remember that even given that strong northward flux in 2010, the annual net flux was still to the south. Um, so uh, in both years, we had a net flux to the south into far south bay. So both of those conditions would lead to, um, potentially lead to increased sedimentation in south bay. Our question back there. I've got a question relative to the uh, remote sensing and its long-term uh, applicability and whether or not it's something that can be uh, sustained over time and or what frequencies of evaluation should, what should be the evaluation period? That's a good question. I, I think the idea was that using satellite imagery like commercially available like Iconos or GOI um, would make it more viable into the future as more and more satellite sensors come on board and they're very similar. Um, as I think the, the three-year pilot project once a year certainly generalizes a lot of complexity, phenological complexity, tidal complexity, but it gives us a good snapshot of what's going on and these things tend to change relatively slowly. Um, so I think going into the future, you know, depending on funds, and I think funds are the key goal here, the, there will be reduced cost because we built the model um, and, and perhaps it doesn't need to be done even every year, but every other year, um, and depending on the availability of imagery and, and cost. Um, so uh, the state of California coordinates with uh, USDA to fly the entire state at at multispectral airborne sensor at one meter right now. So there's, there's the possibility of piggybacking on that as well. So. Okay. Um, Laura. I have a question for Ron Duke. Um, how soon after uh, the restoration at Cooley Landing did you start monitoring for like California clapper rail and salt marsh harvest mouse and some of the the other um, key species of interest in that habitat? Um, well, the, there's been no harvest mouse monitoring, um, although I expect they're there. And the clapper rail um, was done, PRBO did some monitoring out there and there are rails there, but I don't know when that first survey was. Um, and certainly this year, um, uh, the ISP program, when they were out early, they, they saw clapper rails as well. So there's not, a, there's not a monitoring specifically required for that. So. Oh, here we have one more question back there. Hi. Um, I just, I'm thinking about a lot of the work that Bruce and Dave have done over the years looking at sediment supply to the bay as a whole and thinking about the South Bay as the sediment sink and I'm wondering as we're adding more South Bay sediment via opening ponds, are we actually depleting sediment in mudflats in the rest of the bay or is most of the sediment coming really through sediment transport via the delta and tributaries? Are we looking at depleting more of Central Bay because it's already in an erosional pattern right now or are we thinking that's going to maintain itself? Dave, your name is on this too. <laughs> do, do you want to give a shot at it? Well, you'll let me go first. Huh? It's, it's a good question. Again, it, you know, the answer is I don't know. Um, it, again, it depends on that, how connected things are. There, there is a lot of sediment moving through the bay, you know, and it goes out the Golden Gate. And so um, I don't know at this point, and I don't know that anybody knows just what the effects will be if you, you know, increase that sink in the South Bay, whether it, it will result in it sediment that would have gone other somewhere else not going there uh, that's detrimental or whether that's something that just would have gone out the Golden Gate. So I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that, Dave? I have something to add, oh, okay. Um, you know, South Bay is already in a depositional state. Um, and so we, I guess the, the short answer is 
Um, if we don't make a huge increase in the sediment sink in there, I don't, I don't understand how it would change the mudflats up north because, um, because we are in a, a seemingly constant uh, depositional state in South Bay. And we also are getting some um, significant sediment coming in from the tributaries. Uh, we, uh, our group currently has a flux station on, uh, sediment flux station on Coyote Hill Slough or the Alameda Flood Control Channel. Um, and that's one thing we're trying to get a handle on is, is what is the actual input um, of sediment uh, north of the Dumbarton Bridge on that east, co uh, that east shore. Uh, Brenda, I would just add that uh, one piece of information we are lacking is uh, recent bathymetry surveys. And it's been, I believe, 20 or 30 years, Bruce, since the last really full bay survey and another one now just to have a, a sort of a status of the bathymetric change that's been going on for the past couple of decades would be real helpful. Uh, it's uh, about 10.20 now, which is our break time. I'd like to thank the uh, speakers again for their contribution. <laughs> and we'll be having a break and reconvening at 10.35 to talk about aquatic species. So, see you then. Thank you, Dave. We are going to start promptly at 10.35, so if the speakers in session two and the moderator would join us up front, that would be great. Thank you.